Yes. And I would like to uh, welcome everybody and um, I'll welcome John Davis to the uh, stage arm. And uh, we all know that John uh, finished up at Kentucky last year. His dissertation is on cholera in Russia. Uh, he is now one of the world's experts on this issue. Um, and uh, um, he has been, I just want to point this out, a stalwart in helping to keep the CHR running this year and in running the graduate seminar. And um, um, we are, uh, well, I just want to thank you for, for, your, for your efforts. And I also want to thank Nick Freigogel for his efforts in, in these arduous weeks to bring to, of course, you agreed to the comment about six months ago. <laughs> we'll give ourselves all a round of applause later. And, uh, John, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, and thanks to everybody for braving the elements today, and my, my grad students, and all you uh, bulwarks of the CHR, Jim and Chris and Phil and John. Thank you very much for coming out today. And David and the Russian contingent, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, Chris made a comment that that every time a Russian speaks, it snows outside. <laughs> That's how we try to keep the attendance down. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, and thanks to Nick for uh, commenting. I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll benefit by that. I look forward to that. Um, in about 2006, I, I, I'm not a medical historian. I took a, a course on, on medical history at the University of Kentucky, Dr. Eric Christensen. Uh, who has been studying medical history for about 30 years. And I become interested in medical history, and that summer I read Richard Evans' uh, Death in Hamburg, which I really liked. And at that time I could not find any uh, work on the modern epidemics, the, the later epidemics of cholera in Russia. And that's how I decided to do cholera. I, I really liked Evans' book, and I looked at Russia. It had, At that time it had some, some uh, historiography on the earlier epidemics, and there was a book by Roderick McGrew on, on the very early, the 1830 epidemic. So I decided to write a, a, a book or a, a dissertation on cholera in Russia. And my uh, looking at the historiography, there, there's a, there was a theme, and that it's that Russia is backwards, and that's why they had uh, cholera in the 20th century. And I, you know that that was what I decided to question. I, I, I wasn't sure that that was correct. Um, but that was the primary question I looked at. Why did Russia suffer from cholera after 1900? Uh, was it backwards or was, were there other mitigating factors? So I, I read the literature and I read Baldwin, which is the geoepidemiology, uh, who states that Russia's position puts it at, at high risk of, of, of suffering from cholera epidemics. Uh, you guys read the paper. I won't go into that in great detail. But then I, I started looking at the primary sources and I immediately decided, these guys are really backwards. They, 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 I mean, I, I don't know what they're thinking. You know, you look at it and, you know, don't they understand bacteriology? And, and I'm reading it, and I actually wrote up a couple of papers. In fact, David was present at one. Um, I don't know, I'm sure he doesn't remember the paper per se, but he made some comments upon it. And uh, I was very critical of, of Russian physicians at that time. And some of the members said, hey, you ought to, you know, maybe not be so critical and, and look in a different direction. Okay. But I, I was still convinced that this is, this is true. This, you know, they didn't understand bacteriology, and this is why they were back. And I was looking at a 1903, or 1904 report on the Saranov Hospital. The, the, the Alexander, I, well, the, 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 it's an old Soviet hospital. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confused my hospitals. It was the Alexander Hospital. It was the Zemstva Hospital in 1904. And it was a report of the Sanitary Executive Commission which was, were commissions specifically designed to, to fight cholera. This, is, this was a, the only job they had. And it was consisted of czarists and local people. And they had a chemical report on the pipes from a local chemist. chemist. And I'm thinking, this isn't right. You know, but where's, where's the, the, you know, the laboratory bacteriology? Where, where's the count on whether there's, you know, the cholera vibrio here or not? And they're talking about nitrogen in the pipes and things like this. And, and, and I just I couldn't believe it. And, and I even I wrote that up in early drafts. I said, these guys, there's nothing about the, the cholera. 
And uh, but then I, I kept reading it, and I kept noticing that, that the, the way they they formulated Colorado was, it was just totally different. It was there's something unique about it. Um, it, it, and it's what caused me to think they were backwards. But then I finally realized that they don't think it's important whether the, whether the Vibrio is. They, they, they can assume that the Vibrio is there. And what they're looking for is the conditions. Finally, finally I figured this out. The conditions that might spark an epidemic. And that's when I, I read an old uh, Garrison's medical uh, uh, dictionary. Yeah, which from, from the 20s, which it's, it mentioned this that Pasteur and Pettenkoffer are not unopposed. And of course, everything you, you look at in Russia has Pasteur in it. You know, you have to have, if you have a medical book, you have to have a picture of Pasteur and, and you know, some, some prose about how great he was. Um, so that's when I started studying this link between chemistry and, and, and medicine. And that's when I did come upon this idea that, that they always, they always looked at bacteriology different. They looked at it at high gene and bacteriology together. Uh, not in, that's not entirely true, but, but they tended to, and as hygiene and bacteriology developed, this uh, link with chemistry, this, this Pastorian link uh, with the environment, and Pettenkoffer also, really is what they, they formed their, their basis of their analysis. Uh, so I, let me backtrack just a little bit. The historiography started, uh, when you go back to Geoepidemiology, you have basically Baldwin was taking on a, a guy by the name of Erwin Ackerman, who goes back to 1947, uh, and his whole idea is that the political orientation of, of, a, of a country decides how they will approach power or disease in general. So if, if you're, you're the British, you're liberal, you're, you're going to leave the, 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 uh, the roads of, of uh, transportation open. So you're going to take an environmentalist approach. If, if, if you're one of the, the so-called autocracies, Prussia, Russia, or Austria-Hungary, you will take a contagionist approach because you're a police-oriented state and you, will, you like to intervene in, in, uh, in local affairs. So that, that there's this political orientation. Akronek takes this on with geoepidemiology. says, no, it's, it's not. The reason these guys are... are Actually, it's just not true because it's geoepidemiology that matters. This is why there was cholera uh, in, in, in Russia later, and, and Western nations had a, 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 uh, an advantage, right? Because the Eastern nations are applying all these quarantine measures, and the Western nations have advanced warning. So this this is Baldwin's argument. So he's taken on acronym. But this idea of politics remains involved, that politics influences state policy, that, that politics influences medical policy, more importantly. Uh, some, of the, some of the other historiographers, John Hutchison, who um, sees everything, sees the development of bacteriology is largely, that bacteriology was, was really the only, uh, that, that it had all this agency and that environmentalism, and, and of course, Viewing bacteriology versus environmentalism, I, I, I maintain, is not particularly, is, is not valid because you have contagionists and bacteriologists, you have hygienists, and you have uh, environmentalists. And there's an assumption that all uh, bacteriologists were contagionists. And, and I go after that. I, I say that that's, that's not true because uh, the hygienists in Russia were hybrids. They were, they were both bacteriologists and, and hygienists. So, there's this idea that, that political uh, diplomacy sort of held together uh, bacteriology, that the bacteriologists tried not to scare the hygienist off. Um, Elizabeth Hacken starts talking about uh, bridges between the two, between bacteriology, and, and, and I think that's what I'm talking about with chemistry, that, that it was the main bridge that, that pulled both of them together and that kept them together. And both of them talk about there were no back chairs of bacteriology until the 20th century in Russia. Um, and, and I think there's a reason for that, that the hygienists were, were bacteriologists. So it's, it's very complicated, but my, my argument is that Pasteur and Pettenkoff formed the, uh, the backbone of, of Russian medicine and, their, and Russian physicians' anti-cholera measures. At the end of the paper, I, I, I threw in this, this bit about culture, and, and I, I think this is a, a very interesting uh, part but, but it's admittedly underdeveloped. 
19, and, and, I, and there, there, I stopped at 1905 for a reason. 1905 is, is, is really difficult to understand. I think it's almost sort of the key to, to understanding, uh, in some respects, the whole revolution and, and everything that's going on. You have um, the revolution, you have the Russo-Japanese War, and in 1903 you had these, the, the development of these cholera, uh, what do they call them, the, the cholera commissions. And, and, they, and they also have, they have railroad commissions and... and but these commissions that the physicians were angry about because they lost their autonomy. They, you had people from the central government coming in and, and basically telling them what to do, and the Zemsvets, the local organizations, had to pay. So you have all this political uh, turmoil, and you have this revolution that the, the Pirogov physicians, the, the community physicians, support. And so I, I looked at their... I've actually criticized them in, in another paper for... I think their timing was very poor, but their, their idea of this link between social issues and, and cholera, I think, is a good one. Uh, and, and that's what uh, that part is about. It, it's a little bit underdeveloped, and that's why I put it in there, and hopefully you guys will have some good comments on that. Uh, but that's all I really have for right now, so I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Well, we'll open it up to Nick. I'll open it up to Nick, I'm sorry. You can open it up to Nick. Um, thank you, John, for... Uh, for a very, very sort of rich paper. You tried to do an enormous amount uh, in this paper. I was sort of struck each section is taking on different big topics. And, uh, and so kudos to you uh, for, for embracing something that's so big. Um, I have three, maybe four kind of things that I, want, I kind of wanted to talk about coming out of this. And I kind of think of them a little bit as kind of absences and context. I mean, you, you tried to do so much, so I feel bad that you're talking about absences, but I'll, uh, I'll do it anyways, because that's what they pay me the big bucks for. Um, <laughs> I um, so I have some questions. I have some comments. One of the things that sort of struck me um, was that throughout the paper we talk a lot about kind of how they're thinking about cholera and this sort of thing. And that you have brief mentions of of, uh, of of the sort of nature of measures that they're actually taking this sort of thing. Although we end up at the end with this sort of argument that in fact they proved ultimately successful what they tried to do. And I was curious if you could tell us actually a little bit more uh, about. What, it, what, it, what exactly they are doing in terms of measures? Uh, because I was, I was sort of struck at the notion that, that somehow perhaps there might be, you know, were they uniform measures across, the, you know, this is a vast country with incredibly different sort of environmental and uh, ethnic uh, kinds of uh, people, sort of space and people are so fundamentally different from one place to another. Um, and, and I'm sort of struck by, well, so, how, you know, do they take these, this basic model of, you know, environmental contagion as social controls, uh, and, and then apply it fundamentally differently in different places, or is it, are, are they trying to do similar types of things? Uh, and then I'm wondering who, who is. Uh, this is one of the questions I, I also had through coming out. Uh, you mentioned briefly that there's some general laws coming down from Petersburg, um, but then so much of medicine uh, and health policy is controlled very much at the very local level. Uh, the Zemsos, in particular the district Zemsos, uh, that uh, I'm sort of interested in who who is doing all of this, perhaps a little bit more than you have here. Um, so that was one kind of question I was hoping you might elaborate on, because I'm sort of fascinated is how you get from these kinds of ideas to actual measures uh, that you, you believe ultimately are, 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 are successful. Um, I was struck too, a sort of second issue that I, I, that I found very interesting is, you know, a big chunk of the paper deals with this kind of question of the kind of transference of ideas uh, and how we get to these ideas that are developing among this, you know, a small number of uh, Western and Central European scientists, and then how they are then uh, embraced and, uh, and uh, in, in the Russian context. Um, and I was sort of, I want to kind of push you a little bit more in, uh, in that regard, in, in part because in, you do a really nice job of kind of laying out what the different people in other parts of Europe thought. What I was less sure of is exactly how they were received. You have, a, you have sort of a lot of sentences where you say, and the Russians use these ideas. Uh, but then didn't actually really expand on you know, how they built on them, how they thought about them, how they received them, uh, and, and this sort of thing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in for you to perhaps speak a little bit more about exactly what, what are the mechanisms of transference of these kinds of ideas, and how do these ideas are being generated in one type of context uh, then uh, you know, arrive, and, and I would think are, uh, are, are transformed quite drastically uh, as they come into the, into the Russian place. I mean, you know, when I think about uh, you know the model that Totus has in terms of the Darwin, the difference in way Darwin, Darwin's fundamentally understood yes. you know, in the Russian case, um, and uh, and I was also struck to a certain degree about 
so where are the Russian scientists as kind of people in this story? I mean, we have uh, you know, Pasteur and Koch and all these other people, uh, but where are the Russian scientists here? Because the, you know, this is this is a spectacular period in, in Russian yeah. scientific development. Uh, and so I'll start, for example, you know, there's a lot about soil, but where is the Lukashaya? leading soil scientists uh, ever. Uh, and I'm struck too that in some ways what you point out here in terms of this perhaps more um, more holistic, more kind of multi, uh, well, multi-directional kind of view uh, strikes me as, as relatively standard in, in Russian science at this time. I mean, if you take someone like Vernadsky, uh, who's developing these, these broad kind of uh, inclusionist kinds of concepts, more holistic kind of concepts, the Kuchak too, I mean, there's so many of them on in some ways perhaps the most famous, but uh, you know, there's so many that there's something in the nature of Russian scientific and intellectual thought at this time that approaches uh, problems uh, in these kinds of holistic and multi kind of multi-directional sorts of ways. Uh, so that to a certain degree, I'm not surprised to find this, given the, the larger context. Um, a third kind of thing has to do with, one of the things I was sort of struck by to a certain degree was, what I thought about is the kind of absence of Russia here, maybe because we started with Haiti, I was sort of uh, sort of immediately thrown off, but uh, I, uh, I'm easily thrown off, as we know. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, you know, for, for a story that is in some ways about environment and place and these sorts of things, I found that the kind of Russia here was, was much less present than I thought it might be, and, and both in terms of the people and in terms of the, you know, the, the environment itself. I mean, it obviously is a, a country that, you know, has just about every kind of environmental uh, sort of ecological zone that, that one can imagine, from yeah. the deserts to the, to the tundra to the Arctic and, and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, place matters, it seems to me, and, and where is this kind of environment here? And, and it struck me, too, that you have a lot of great, you, you know, you have examples from Baku and Odessa and Saratov and Tashkent and Astrakhan and this sort of thing, but it matters, it strikes me, which ones of these ones looking at. These are very different types of places, uh, yeah. you know, environmentally, ecologically. Uh, climate, uh, and, and and not to mention in terms of people. Um, you know, th this is one of these great stories. Uh, you talk about the problem of trying to control cholera in such a big place. Uh, this is another one of these stories that reminds me of the degree to which you know, Russia expanded, or you know, Muscovy expanded, as part of an effort to become you know, this great world power. But in the process of expansion, it then introduces a series of uh, of threats and weaknesses by being so large, by integrating itself much more fully into uh, this larger kind of Eurasian kind of continents. And so uh, the, uh, it's, I don't know, it's a paradox that as they get bigger and ostensibly stronger, at the same time they're allowing for the possibility of uh, all of these new types of diseases to come in. Um, and, and the cholera hits in particularly sensitive zones uh, politically and imperially. Uh, and this was one part of the story, I mean, you talk about the kind of cultural part at the end that I really thought deserved more attention uh, was, was the fact that so much of this is happening in, uh, in, uh, in, in highly sensitive zones uh, from an imperial perspective. And I was struck, I mean, you mentioned, uh, which suddenly blew me away, that, they, uh, that there was this, uh, there were what, 20, 20 um, bacterial investigations into this female bathhouse, yes, uh, Muslim yes. female bathhouse in Baku. Which you sort of mentioned, kind of as a line or two, and I thought, oh my god, uh, yeah. what? Uh, I mean, I was amazed that they got in once, uh, let alone that they're doing twenty. Uh, that they're that, that this is a series of kind of investigations into this sort of area in a, uh, and uh, and so you know, and then you have the whole you know, the, the, the the cholera riots in Tashkent because of the different ways in which cholera measures are applied differently you know, to the uh, you know, to the Central Asian population as opposed to the Russian one and. Uh, uh, and so that there's there's a whole sort of imperial, ethnic, religious context here, which I think is extraordinary. I would have thought is extraordinarily important in terms of how all these measures are, um, you know, are being played out. Um, so I was really struck by that. I mean, I suppose I was also struck by um, perhaps the absence of, of some aspects of the broader context. I'm, I'm shifting from multi-ethnic here. Uh, that I found I mean, these years, 189, you know, say 92 to 1905, these are dramatic years uh, in, uh, in, in Russian history. So, you know, we've got, we start with the famine in 91, we have, uh, you know, rapid industrial change coming out of nowhere, urbanization, uh, in, in industrialization, massive amounts of migration with the building of the railroads, the Trans-Siberian, I mean, the, the list sort of goes on, revolution, war. Uh, so that these are, 
these are dramatic uh, kinds of times, and so that kind of context seems also kind of important, both physically as well as kind of culturally. Um, the last thing I just kind of wanted to say, which, which was to kind of, and it's something that I'll push you on, and, and I suppose this, this keeps going further from, um, from what you were saying that you've been pushed on already in terms of how to, how to think about Russian medicine and, uh, and this sort of thing. Um, because I think that there's, you know, there's been enough recently that has really been rethinking particularly the nature of the, the place of doctors, particularly the place of Zemstvo medicine. I'm thinking particularly of Lucy Bradley on, uh, on, on the Pyrrhic uh, Congresses and this sort of thing, and the kind of particular relation with some of the state, or Yevtohov's book just recently on, on Nizhny Novgorod, uh, and, uh, and the incredible role sort of the, of the Zemstvo and Zemstvo medicine. Um, and partly just to kind of, I suppose, to, to challenge the idea of, of, of this constant tension with the Tsarist state. That I think that uh, uh, the Ziemskos, I mean, so much of what we're starting to see coming out of the strategy now is, is, is not necessarily Ziemsko doctors in uh, intention, but rather, I mean, they're frustrated because they're not getting the support that they might like. You know, they want the central government to be giving them more money, but are not necessarily um, you know, ones that are, um, uh, but that, that sort of deep divide that you talk about. Seems perhaps out of a slightly older historical, historiographical uh, tradition. We're seeing something different, but then I wonder once if we do see this difference in the relationship with state power, and, and just a fundamental difference in terms of how medicine was organized, and, and, and the extraordinary success in some ways of these very local uh, you know, uh, medical structures, um, you know, from the from the 1870s on. Uh, you know, how does that change how we think about the reception of cholera and the response to cholera, this sort of thing? They are increasingly we seem to see them as uh, as ultimately extraordinarily well functioning. I mean, before there was a sort of sense of well, it's just a mess, but now I think more and more this is sort of sense that they are well organized, uh, and increasingly well funded, and very thoughtful uh, and egalitarian in their approach. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm sort of struck by uh, you know by that. And I would push you to kind of think think more about what the nature of the medical system and, and just who these doctors are. I mean, there's a lot of mention of community doctors here, but who are these people, and, uh, and to really kind of think about their place within, you know, within the political system, within the social system, and uh, um, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I have other sorts of questions, but those are those were kind of the four sort of four areas that I was really kind of thinking about as I came out of uh, out of this paper in terms of suggestions and questions. But thank okay. you for all your hard work on yeah, to this. Thank you for all your hard work, and uh, I think I'll start. Sort of on your last question, and move backwards. If I, can. If, I, if I leave anything out, let me know. Um, I think your 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 idea about the, the Tsarist government is, is a really good one, and and I I don't mean to, to and I do bring up this separation. But one of the ideas I have, and, and this is from a separate paper, was that this legislation in 1903 is a series of legislation in 1903. Um, Barbara Engelstein talks about some of it, and there's a lot of legislation in 1903 that, and, and a lot of it has to do with relaxing uh, restrictions, re relaxing uh, uh, for Muslims, freedom of movement on the railroad, uh, more uh, passports, more access to passports. I think this was very, a very smart move on, on, the, on the Tsarist government's part. And I think this, this really plays into this whole idea that, that um, the Pettenkofferian uh, medical approach, this environmental medical, medical approach, was, was very amenable to that. And that um, physicians, they really, that they had the scientific background to really believe in this. So they're not trying to ingratiate themselves with the government, necessarily. And, and in fact, I was trying to prove that they, they did not have, they were not trying to ingratiate themselves with the government, that they're not always in bed with the government. And, but uh, I didn't mention it, but Hinza talks about this. In 1904, they, they sent the VA Taranukin and SI Zlatogorov to Persia on an expedition. And I think this was a great move on their part. And, and they went there and they, they uh, gave free medical treatment and, and, and vaccinations. Zlatogorov was a big performer of, of uh, vaccination. And he's one of these unknown physicians that I should, probably should talk and, and do in my dissertation and will in my manuscript. But... Um, I think this was what and the historiography sees this legislation too much. I think in, in Machiavellian terms. I think I think it was a 
was a decent move on the part of the government, or a positive move. And, and like I said, in another paper, I actually am, am sorry, kind of critical of it, that the physicians support the revolution when the, at the same time that the government's making this point, that, that I, it seems to me to be positive and, and that, you know, where they're thinking along the same lines. Um, it's almost like they're polarized to the extent that, that you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, like political polarization where even if they agree, they can't just, they can't agree sometimes. Um, by the same token, you have uh, this idea of fr freedom of restriction of movement for Muslims, as the historiography has seen that as allowing cholera to run free. Uh, I, I see it more as, you know, they're avoiding cholera rights. I mean, 1892, and, and, and there were riots right into 1905 and 1910. 1905 was a very tumultuous year, obviously. So they're very aware that, that, that they could have cholera riots, and they're trying to, to bring up uh, their policy with the rest of Europe. So I, I think that's a very good point, and I, and I see that as a positive move. Uh, although the historiography, a lot of it, um, seems to look, view it as back in going. They're trying to, to you know, uh, bolster their power or something like that. I, I, which, what government doesn't try to, to boost their own power? You know, I, I don't know of any that does. It's, the mention of Baku and the mention of the, of the Banyas is, is great. I, 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 I wish I could find more, more information like that. Um, and I agree that that needs to be developed. It, I, there's not a lot of literature on it, I, I don't, and, I, and I need to probably search more for, for something like that. But uh, that goes along with this idea. This is that Himalaya was trying to find uh, cultural conditions that cause cholera. So um, these people, Muslims, of course, made an easy target. But so they they ignore that there's cholera in Baku at the, at the you know at the ports of entry, and but they find it at these bonds, uh, which it was also found at the port, port of entry. And, and this investigation was was really even Kamalaya admitted it a little bit that uh, well you know some of these we didn't really investigate here but we had 20 of them. I think they were probably these these Muslims made easy targets. Well, it's a standard policy to blame Muslim populations for cholera. I mean, we see it in Kabachkan with the riots in 1992 and that sort of thing. So that, that's, they, they do become an easy... So, I mean, there was something else I was thinking about, is that you have the uh, you have this, this sort of focus on the science in, in much of, of, the, of, of, of the, the paper, but then, in some ways, in the application, there's clear, uh, there's clear distinctions based on uh, ethnic or religious categories. That, uh, and, and there is this sort of sense of the Muslims and change their, you know, civilize them, uh, and change yes. their behavior, then that would be one way of dealing with the cholera problem. Exactly. If, if we can educate them, and of course they, they were really not trying to, as I, to Christianize them anymore, but they wanted to, to educate them, and it's this whole idea of social conditions, under education, and uh, they talked about education, and allowing them to run, to, you know, not, not stopping them, not hindering them. And there's even, as you, as you move on through 1907 and, and, and further up, the government's coming out with decrees to, to sort of counsel local physicians that uh, leave Muslims alone. You don't understand their, their, their policies. Their, their medicine is good medicine. And at the same time, you have physicians like N.I. Tezikov and Saradov saying, look, we need, to, we, need to, we need more controls on the railroad. We, we need more contagionist. Uh, we need more... Control over over our movements. You know, we're, we're, this is allowing power to run free. And, and he was right, I think. But so there's this tension. How how, how many controls do you put in place where you, you don't cause a power riot and, and you're still sensitive and not just uh, you know repressing people? And I think the government was really trying to to, to do the right thing. Uh, one physician that was very important was uh, Vladimir Terenukin, who was a very sharp guy and. and was kind of a mouthpiece for the government at all these uh, meetings and, and really was, was a very formidable fellow. And uh, the guy who went to Persia in 04 and 05. And, and also back in the 1890s, they sent a fellow by the name of P.V. Kafkin to Japan to, to, to give uh, uh, cholera vaccination. So they're, they're clearly, there's something, and, and this is my next, my next project, there, there's clearly a, a connection between vaccination and foreign policy. 
on the, on the borders. This is, this is very good PR, and it's part of the programs. Uh, we move up a little bit further is uh, mechanisms of transference. Uh, that's where the, re the research schools come in, obviously. And it's this idea, I, I think I, I have the idea, and, and a lot of it's in the, the, the uh, 1993 OSIRIS, which there's a whole uh, issue that's on the research schools. Great, great issue, great reading. I mean, I was told, read it, don't get too carried away with it. And I wrote about 70 pages on it, you know, and finally caught myself. It's, it's really fascinating, and it's how that, you know, these research schools transferred onto people like, uh, well, Meshnikov, I've actually went west, but uh, Himalaya, who, would, who worked at the, at the, the uh, Pasteur Institute, and, and a lot of times Pasteur would, would announce it when, when they come up with some type of finding, it would be Pasteur who would announce it. Himalaya has come up with a vaccination for cholera, or um, um, Savchenko, Bezredka, these guys. Uh, and, and of course, there's a big link between the Institute of Experimental Medicine and, and the Pasteur Institute. Um, you have all these stations that are called Pasteur stations around. So the, this Pasteur is, I guess, I don't know if it's a Kunian type. I think it is, but it's probably a lot more malleable because it's it's, it's biology. It's, and Kuhn restricted everything to physics, but I, but I still think these structures have agency. They they move with these guys and, and they carry them with them and they pass them on to their own students. And and Russians. I won't say they, they swallowed them whole, but they they had re part of my argument is they had reason to believe in this uh, this cognitive foundation because it, as you go further east, the environment seems to be more involved in cholera. Uh, you have the eastern nations, uh, Italy, and the southeastern nations, Italy, uh, the, the East Germans, the, and, the, and the Eastern Europeans, the Russians. Uh, and the Italians following Pettenkoffer's theories, but Hamburg, and, in, and after 1867, in England goes back to contagionist theories. Even the French were contagionist in 1903. They, they in the night after the 1903 sanitary uh, international sanitary uh, meeting, they decided to put more contagionists uh, at, at Baku to, to bottleneck or at Dessen, I'm sorry, to bottleneck down there and, and, and to, to shut off. The border. At the same time, Russia's becoming more liberal. Uh, so it's, it, there's, there's tension there on that. And that's part of my argument, is that this uh, fighting cholera in Russia actually backed up those theories. The way cholera acted, the way the, the environment was so terrible in Russia, it, it was awful. You know, and, and, and along the Volga, and, and, and Hens talks about this, I didn't talk about this very much. You have these ravines, you have people who live along these ravines, who, who are undereducated, do not get city water, uh, who drink out of what they, they call them Persian wells. They drink out of these wells, bad wells, and, and they got sick, obviously. And, and the cholera rates were very high in Saratov, and, and at the Klevichev Ravine, uh, Himalaya said, this is probably the, the highest cholera rate in Russia, in, in Saratov. Uh, and of course, as you go up this, if you put a bottleneck in Odessa, you're going to have more traffic up, up the wall. And, and Howard Markle writes this book about traffic between Petersburg and Hamburg and, and New York. And this becomes the, the big conduit. And that's where Petersburg just got hammered, you know, continuously with all these, with, because they're, they're have, it, it's the, the window to the west. And on the upper ball, then you have Rubensk, or Rubensk, and what was called every summer the Rubensk Caravan, which basically sent to, uh, ship after ship after ship up this canal. To Petersburg, so that that's where I'm going with that is that not only did did the Russians have this connection with uh, the Pasteur Institute, but but these this model seemed to be it seemed to fit for them geographically. As far as Russian history, Russian culture, there is that idea out there that the Russians are environmentalists, that uh, the populists were environmentalists. I, I think. Uh, Lisa Walker says that they were the populace were uh, elemental soil, something of that nature. So that that is important, and, and, and that is lacking. Um, I, I need to, part of my, my my whole idea for 1905 is that the way the Russians approached cholera in 1905 has to do with their, their culture. 
and, and they're not, you know, I, I think maybe this this whole environmental idea was, was more amenable to their culture. They're not, you have this large country, and they're not fast starting. They, they argue to the nth degree. They argue and argue and argue in these commissions, and they, they don't, there's a real extreme hesitancy to act. Um, so it, it's, if you're, you're going to do contagionism, you have to get out there and you have to put out measures immediately and, and move. And, and, and I'm not sure that that was really meaningful to them uh, on, that, on that respect. Uh, so I think I have most of it. Yeah. So why don't we open up the floor? Um, I'll tell a little story while we're waiting, which is, I think I told this before, my, mother, my wife's maternal grandmother family, I think she was born in Staten Island, but her family left Odessa in 1891 and went to Humber, where so they escaped one cholera epidemic and landed in <laughs> So, well, let's open a great up. story. John. Yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, this is a really interesting paper. And I think there are, I, I was struck right off the bat by two countries. One is you question the chronology. And I think that is very important and striking. There was cholera much later. There was cholera after Hunger. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's really a very important point that I think a lot of people have missed. Uh, the second part is I think you've done a really nice intellectual history here. And I would like to see you combine these two because I think you've got uh, your Kochians, or whatever you call them, uh, the powers of Koch, sure. uh, who are saying uh, we have to think in terms of germ theory. Uh, the people who have written this history are presentists. And so they have moved back further than actually was true at the time. And if you look at what people believed various times, Russia was not the only place where there were people who were having problems with what became classic germ theory. Yes. And that, you are, I think you, you show this very nicely. I give you two frameworks. Uh, one is, the, there were two big problems with simple germ theory. <laughs> uh, one was resistance. Mm -hmm. People have resistance. I think Meshnikov, in fact, was a major propounder of this idea. And uh, second, um, was the concept of the carrier, that is, someone without symptoms who carries a disease. In the United States, everybody heard of typhoid Mary. Look at the date of typhoid Mary and see how late it was when people really caught on. It was publicized, really, after 1905. So this was a great unknown. They couldn't account for how this was showing up. Here are people with no symptoms at all. You pass them through, and they bring all kinds of terrible things. And you look at the timing on that, and I think it will help put your your narrative in much better context. So that's one framework. Thanks, John. It, it, yes, I'm glad you brought up the, the uh, healthy carriers, as, as the, the Germans call them, Bacillin the Uh They they actually, the Russians knew about the, uh, and Klodnitsky was a big proponent. He says, uh, you have to be careful with these Bacillin Tracker because they can carry the uh, disease through and, and nobody knows it, they, they can probably get to a quarantine station, no problem, unless, unless you're doing a bacteriological, a bacteriological test on them, you're not going to find it, and which is why they, they quarantine a lot of people for 
seven days, the incubation period of seven days. But then it still wouldn't work. Well, it's, yeah, it's 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 the Russians felt that this was a needle in a haystack that, that it's going to get in, and and uh, I think this idea that you could shut off the borders in Russia and keep it out, even in England, after uh, according to the. Uh, the, the English physician said even after 1867, the Vibrio got inside England when, when, they, when they started doing contagious measures, but they had excellent local conditions that, that they built up over the years. So it's, it's to keep carriers out of Russia, you know, it, it's, it's counterfactual, but whether they could have done it or not, I, I have serious doubts. That, you know, and, and, and of course, it's semi endemic, it, it lives there for, for a year or two, and even. Like they were talking about in Haiti, once it's there, it's hard to get rid of. It, it, it takes a while to leave. How long it could live there? Uh, it definitely lived there for over over the winters in, in the twenties. So, that, I think those are really good points as far as resistance. I, I do touch on vaccination in my in my uh, in, in May, uh, message called Vegas City Theory um, of vaccine versus Paul Ehrlich, and that sort of ties into this whole research schools, the, the Germans versus the French and, the, and it was the same groups that were against each other. Ehrlich, of course, it's Ehrlich versus Mesnikov uh, on their, their vaccination theories. And I, I, my next project is going to be all about that. It's the timing that I want, that I want particularly to call your attention. Okay. Because if you look at events in Russia when they were happening, as opposed to intellectual events elsewhere, okay. that is really going to show. This is not so out of the way. Your story is a very good one because it won't go out of the way if you look at that chronology. We will do. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. I know there was a hand along here, and then I know Glenn was, is, uh, is, so where do we go? This is down here, and then over to Glenn. So Jim, do you want to go first? I like the fact that you had a rather nice balance in the paper as between those who felt that the germ theory hypothesis represented the epitome of progress in medicine versus the more uh, comprehensive environmentalist perspective. You know, when I studied history of uh, bacteriology slash microbiology years ago, when I had the clear impression that Pettenkopper was some kind of a fool, or the yep. author of the genius, and so on. Now, you left out the stuff in the story about Pettenkopper swallowing the, the uh, auger uh, uh, the species, species of the, of the uh, color of the yeah. silks and surviving the experiment. So. But, uh, no, I like, I like that dimension very much. Another angle on this, to which you devoted some space, I'm not prepared to say a lot more, but, but the point about the, a chemical perspective versus a more purely medical one, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. That's, a, that's an issue that's going to, that's coming to the fore, and it's something I'm working on right now, having to do with the origin of chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, um, Ehrlich was really a, a genius, and in many ways he was yes. quite ahead of other people in his thinking about a lot of things. But, uh, uh, you know, so the intellectual people said, like, you know, the chemistry could have something to say. So, uh, and I want to kind of find out a lot more about that. But anyway, this is a very nice paper. And, uh, now, you didn't seem, and I'm not saying you should, but I, you didn't seem to emphasize more the idea of a French perspective versus a German perspective, versus et cetera. I wonder whether that was deliberate, or you didn't want to touch it, or how you feel about this. No, that's a great point. It, you know, it, I'm aware of that, and, and, and I don't I don't see a lot on it, mm -hmm. other than Pasteur, mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact that in 1910, the, the, in Petersburg, the Russians had the French, uh, the uh, filter, the, fr the French system of, of water filter. They were looking at them, but I, I just didn't see them that much. And and, and I agree with you. I, I don't. It's it's not in there. Um, a, a little bit of information on the swallowing with Petkov. Mesnikov also swallowed cholera. Oh, I Sevchenko and Zabalatnia also swallowed cholera. Uh, yeah, they all did these self experiments. <laughs> um. uh, John, I, I too uh, really like your paper, and I, I like the way that you sort of show this dichotomy between contagionism and environmentalism was maybe not so stark. Uh, the fact that these bacteriologists could also be environmentalists. I think that really um, adds a lot of nuance to our understanding. Um, I was going to encourage you to to do a little more about the um, say a little more about the, the ethos of Russian physicians uh, and how that.
predispose them really to environmentalist approaches. Um, the fact that they are this educated elite living in an underdeveloped country where they have this almost sense of moral ob obligation to try to uplift the masses, improve their conditions, the sense they have that the Russian autocracy is not, has not done that, uh, makes them really um, inclined to try to uh, approach these issues of living conditions and nutrition and things like that um, already, even, even you know, apart from medical issues. So I think that that is something that kind of, um, you know, they're building on there. Um, and then sort of related to that and to Nick's last point, um, this case, this issue of, you know, the autocracy and the intelligentsia, are they really, is there really such antipathy between the two? You know, this I think is evolving over time. That, Really, you see by the end of the 19th century, there are certain um, members, even of the Pirogov Society, who are generally very much against the state, who are beginning to see a need to address some of these issues on a larger scale. Uh, and they're not necessarily so much against state power, they just want a more competent state. That is, uh, if they see this, the Russian bureaucracy as ineffectual and corrupt, not really doing its job. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are, you know, the tradition of the Pirogov Society was to just to do local medicine. Uh, and yet, I think uh, among Russian physicians, there is this evolution towards larger um, technocratic approaches that might benefit from state power. And in fact, that actually underlays um, or makes possible what happens after the revolution, when a lot of these people play a leading role in the development of Soviet medicine. Right? Initially there too, they're very much against the Bolsheviks, and yet they come to see common cause with them uh, in terms of like combating all these epidemics, typhus in particular, um, but also cholera after the revolution. Uh, so I think, I think you see um, you know, an evolution over time there. Thanks, David. I, I think that's very true. Uh, um, Especially about about uh, they did resist formal the Bolsheviks basically until the until they saw that that the Bolshevik medicine was going to be social medicine it was going to be broad it was going to approach uh, and Krug makes that point in his dissertation that, that it was going to include everything that the Zemstvo and the Pirogov tradition uh, stood for mm -hmm. and, and and this is what this 1905 this this issue in 1905 which. They had it underdeveloped. I mean, I, I'm not sure how easy it is to, 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 to you know, decide what culture is. We just had some readings a few weeks ago that said it's very difficult. Anthropologists today don't understand what culture is. These guys were doing, using culture very broadly, but this was important to them. And, and I think that it does go back to what Nick said about where is the car, where is the problem. The problem is in is in the traditional rebellious areas, so to speak. You know. Uh, Volga, which is sort of a semi-periphery -peri at that time, um, and, and where you know there was a tr traditional hotbed of, of uh, resistance, um, and, and there's the idea that you know there, there's no serfs there; they're all free men. So I think that's important. And, uh, I think I need to rethink that, um, and, and I think putting you know the clinic in, in rural areas was, was very important in central medicine, and that is very underdeveloped. And I appreciate you bringing that up. I'll look into that. Yeah. Um, a brief aside, I looked up uh, typhoid Mary, and thank you, John, for pointing that out. And it's actually in 1908. 1908. 1908 is when uh, typhoid Mary became a prominent news story. So that's certainly going to be relevant to your topic. General knowledge. Right. Was what very you... slow coming yeah. about carriers. That was my point. Okay. So my, if you look at the dates, go back to those dates. All kinds of things will untang come out because otherwise you have presentism, which is well everybody knew. Of course, not everybody okay. did not. Right. Yes, yes. That's a very valuable point there. Yeah. And uh, to get back to kind of the broader commentary, I know you are intending to publish this as a journal article, so I want to kind of target my comments uh, in that regard. Um, so I think you had a really, and uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with Nick that you 
really did a lot for this paper, and I wonder if it's a little much for a journal article. Mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage you to slim down some sections and kind of position yourself in a broader sense in the historiography. So this is what I'm thinking. Maybe, perhaps, make you, you seem really interested in the intellectual history of this idea. Yeah, and perhaps you can reposition yourself, uh, this article, as an intellectual history of the transference of ideas and not talk really about the practices and not make claims about the success or failure uh, or kind of, you know, mention this uh, as you know, they succeed or they fail, but don't focus at all on claims if what you're really interested in as an article is talk about intellectual history. That's one approach. Okay. Then you can cut out the last part about cultural practices because if you go into Baku and the Muslims, you have, I think you you can't do that without dealing with Jadidism and Adib Khalid and, and, and there's a whole other historiography I'm not sure you want to deal with in, at, at this point. Um, so, and also to cut out some of the detail on the Western uh, uh, biology and kind of, you know, because it would be a little bit too much of a journal article. And to position yourself a bit more broadly in the Soviet historiography, so kind of about the professionalization of science, and Nick mentioned some names, and I think also um, some reference, you probably read these, but uh, Joe Bradley's Voluntary Associations in Tsarist Russia, okay. I think he focuses a lot on science and on patriotism, and I, I think that could be helpful. And uh, Daniel Beer's Renovating Russia, so kind of these um, articles, these books on um, the human sciences and the professionalization of science. And I think the professionalization aspect can be particularly beneficial to you uh, if you talk, talk about the historiography and professionalization of medicine, of the sciences, how these folks are trying to really consider themselves to be professionals and what kind of uh, interactions they have with each other. And perhaps a little bit more broadly on what interactions they have with officials. So one of the things I would like to have seen would be a discussion of their interactions of these uh, professionals, uh, hygienists, all the types of doctors you speak about, community physicians with officials. And perhaps their conversations with each other, one of the things I did not get from this article, and I'm sure there must have been, would be uh, conflicts between them. Conflicts yes. between various physicians, conflicts uh, between physicians and officials. So different ways of interpreting things, perhaps in different geographical contexts, as Nick uh, was stating. So uh, that could be, I think, a, a fruitful line of, um, a, a, a fruitful topic to pursue. And um, another aspect that I would like to see more of, and particularly in the context of backwardness. So I think if you use the term backwardness, it's hard for you to escape than for the journal article speaking about modernity. Uh, so this is certainly a time of, you know, when Russia is perceived as coming into modernity, so the fin de siècle. Uh, so all of these themes, I think modernity is a very important theme that's very present in the field of Russian literature. I think it's something that you would benefit from discussing, uh, especially in relation to professionalization. And uh, finally, uh, one topic that struck me that I would have liked to have seen, or maybe it would be really interesting if it's not present, would be discussions of Russian patriotism and a uniquely Russian way of uh, looking at medicine. Was there uh, a sense of these doctors being patriots and them ignoring these improper Western methods and only incorporating what they thought was proper, what they thought they, they could benefit from, and then really look, using local knowledge? So was there a sense of opposing certain improper uh, Western ideas of the nationalists and patriots. So. Thanks, Cliff. Those are great ideas, and I, you know, and, and I think you're absolutely right about about cutting the social part out. I I, I had to put that in there because I felt that it, it gets right at the, the core of, of what our our CHR, our, our um, the CHR is about this year. So I, I put it in there, but I, I thought about cutting it out. And then, of course, the Western medicine. I did go a little overboard on some of that. I, I agree. Um, it, it's interesting to me, and I, and I get carried away with it, and could, it, that could definitely be cut down for sure. Um, modernity and, and, and conflicts, I think, and, and how officials talk to one another, I think that goes back to what David was talking about, that, you know, professionalization, how they dealt with it. the state. David has a very good point. That, that they really were not against the state. They actually wanted the state to act quicker, that, you know, that 
Zabalatia just went crazy in 1912 over a, a plague epidemic because he said the government does nothing. They just they sit on their hands and you know they do nothing. And, and then of course there's and I could, something I could build on. John Hutchinson has a great uh, part in his book about uh, Jorge Rain and, and all these bacteriologists trying to build and, and, and actually building part of the, the infrastructure of Soviet medicine, uh, Zebuadia, on the Rain Commission. So, and, and that actually goes back to the Bakken Commission in 1892. So that that's something I could bring out more. So thanks a lot. Those are great suggestions. Um, and I'm trying to think what else. Uh, modernity. Definitely this is about modernity. And this, I, I'm looking for this uniquely Russian thing. I mean, they're, they're always, I think attack and cough is part of it. It's like, you know, we don't like your idea. We don't like this little micro. This, this, this is not a, 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 a Russian way of looking at something. But, you know, we look at everything. And you come to us with this little microbe. And, and as Kamalea would say, it's not sufficient color and it's not sufficient shape anyway. And, and was considered to have successfully refuted. So I, I, I'm thinking along those lines and very much. So thanks for reinforcing that. And uh, did I miss anything? Okay, I think it. No. Oh, you want to go? You want to go? All right. Um, I think it's a follow up with that about. Um, what you're doing in this article and what you're contributing to. And one of the big things you're, you're doing is you're contributing to an ongoing recuperation of the idea of environmental medicine during this period. Um, as, as Jim points out, um, there was a time when a clean break between the kind of miasmatic and the, the bacteriological uh, model was was kind of uh, in vogue. It, it's obviously gone over the past you know, few decades, really slowly, um, and you're continuing to that re and as you, but what you're doing, I think, at the same time is, or what you need to be thinking about more, is, is how the idea of environment is, is undergoing transformation without being jettisoned. Um, in a bacteriological model, the environment is mediating, um, it's facilitative. Um, you can have particular environments within which microbes proliferate, or particular environments within which microbes die. But you, yeah. microbes can never be generated. And really, the only thing that's really changed is this idea of, of, of the kind of sui generis uh, generation. <laughs> that's, that's a spontaneous generation. Yes, yes, exactly. Spontaneous generation, thank you. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's that. That's the only thing that's gone. Environment still remains. It still remains significant. But one type of environmental agency uh, has disappeared. Um, and another way of uh, kind of rethinking about this is to, re is to think sort of ecologically, um, to think about what kinds of disease ecologies uh, are in place, what's enabling uh, this particular uh, germ to flourish, to fly, to spread, uh, which gets you into the history of Russian toilets and all that kind of stuff, I'm sure. Um, we have this sort of genealogy of toilets in Western Europe now, and I think we need to sort of do a contribution uh, to the East here. Toilet <laughs> Sort of cesspool, uh, closet, water closet. Um, I've noticed in trains, but anyway. That's anyway, that's um, toilet studies. Um, <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah, we have to pay for yeah. <laughs> it's important. Um, and and finally, if, you, if you're going to be thinking about development, uh, you know, maybe you need to consider modernity, but you also, but uh, backwardness, you should consider development um, and the kind of developmentalist ideas that are present. Um, one of the good things about this, thinking about development is it gets you out of uh, the appalling tangled literature on modernity um, and trying to make a kind of claim that this is Russian modernity or this is, uh, which gets awfully difficult. The literature is mind boggling. And, you know, but if you think about development, that's a lot more straightforward. And I think your, the term is being used by contemporaries perhaps an awful lot more. So, um, that's that's the thing. You mean uh, like as a po as vis a vis industrial development or just or yeah economic development trans the idea of, of there being some set of transformative economic circumstances. Uh, if you sort of read literature in the early twentieth century, uh, the word development is everywhere. Um, whereas the word modern is is probably not there quite so much. So, okay, I, I was not really aware of that. 
I have no idea about Russian, I don't read Russian, but um, that's another question. Okay, th thank you very much. It's interesting that NIH has a cough said that we, we need to check every toilet uh, on, on the trains. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, they, they were aware that this problem, with, they were with toilets. They, it was a big problem for them. I, I never have figured out what Petkoff was talking about, a toilet pit. But I, I know what an outhouse is. I'm from Kentucky. Well, you, know how a toilet, you know how a toilet would work on a train? Oh, like that. Yes. Well, I mean that it's an open, just to the ground. Dumps on the yes. ground. Yes. Right. Just as long as it's clear. Yeah. That's 40 miles an hour. Um, it's not a pleasant thought. No, it's not. <laughs> it still does on many rest of the train. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, we've taken a straight. Okay, so let's <laughs> move on. <laughs> let's move on. You're in the market. Um, I'm curious about. As as Nick started, you jar, you sort of start with Haiti, and you never come back to it in the paper. And I'm curious why you. I'm, I'm always I don't know. Perhaps this is my naivete as a junior graduate student, but I'm always leery about making sort of policy recommendations while writing history. And so I'm curious. Was it just to be an interesting hook, or why hate, Why do you start the paper with Haiti when this is a paper about Russia in 100 years prior? And as you are evolving the paper, is that a, something you either need to expand upon or cut out potentially? That's a good point, Jim. I, I, and I don't come back to it. You're right. The, the reason I started with it was the idea that if, if you can have this kind of problem in the modern age, if you can have what essentially was a was a was a huge well it, it had an earthquake mm -hmm. so it wasn't just cholera but it was tight that, that if you have these conditions and you can have this problem and the UN is incapable of dealing with it mm -hmm. that that it's, it's kind of difficult to say that, that Russia a hundred years ago should have should be considered you know that we should cast aspersions on them for not being able to deal with, with what was a huge problem. But, but your point's well taken, and, and the policy thing just sort of slipped in there, I think. Mm. Well, that's an individual choice. It's, yeah. No, but you, you, that's a good point, and, and, and I should come back to that. And, and, uh, but there's the idea that you, you should tie things in with, with what is going on today. And, and I'm always hands off from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, actually, my committee had something to say about it. They wanted to do that. <laughs> if you can smuggle a policy recommendation into a, into a, into a, a paper or particularly a, a proposal, uh, you might get some money. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well this, this is I why I'm going to advise me. Particularly if you're going to the National Science Foundation, so right. you've got to leave it in the last paragraph. Mark, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions about the disease itself, and maybe this is sort of beyond the scope of this paper, but I'm curious. Um, so, on the subject of the Russian environment, how does cholera respond to sub zero temperatures? I mean, maybe less relevant from the lower Volga, but I was curious, you know, would that sort of stem outbreaks at the end of the season or how, how that was uh, functioning? That's a, yeah, um, And uh, I'm also curious about these vaccines and, and how you would produce a vaccine for bacterial disease. What, what, you know, what were these things? And then this is a totally different question. Um, I think I thought it was really interesting in this paper how you showed the continuity and, and ideas and so forth between the Tsarist regime and the Soviet era. And I was wondering, were there any um, you know major disjunctures that you're aware of in terms of practices, like a, like uh, sewage systems, more than you know focus on on that sort of go back to toilets. Uh, <laughs> that that kind of end of development was that something that was more of a was emphasized more in the Soviet era. Well, the, the Soviets certainly tried to make this juncture there. Um, they were trying to build, you know, during the Tsarist Russia, they were always trying to put in sewer systems. And none of them worked right. And, and they worked worse than, than this system of, of, you know, you see, it, it goes back to the 1850s in England when these guys were carrying this refuse out and, and, and digging it. Actually, that system worked better than, than the sewer systems. So the, the, what, the Tsar, uh, what the Soviets did was they, they they borrowed a, a term from the French. It's like a, a sinization or something like that. It's it's a system of sewage removal with with machines and and, and they there's if you look in the Bolshoi Medicinska Encyclopedia, it's it's in there. Just look under uh, 
this word, assinization, assinization. And it's a French word, and, and actually the French word is like a assinismen or something like that. But, um, and what they said was, well, this, we, we got this from the French, this is modern, this is social hygiene, this is nothing. It's the same system with fancier machines that the, that the czars were using. It, it, it was effective, but you couldn't get all this mountains and mountains of refuse out of the city. You know, they, they, they used pet and coffers theory to say, okay, we have 8 million tons of refuse that we cannot remove from the city. They, they knew they had this problem. It, 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 was, it was a huge problem for them, especially in the Volga, where some cities still do not have you know, sewer, sewer systems. Um, the disease itself, um, well, I'm trying to, the vaccines, at first they started out using dead bacteria. And then, you know, and, and this is something that I'm looking into for future articles, but they started using the, the blood of horses and, 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 and um, you know, I, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you, but I, I know they started out using dead bacteria, then they would use other other things. I mean, it, it was pretty crude to start out, but the I didn't do to. Sorry. Yeah, they were they were using yeah. This is like horse syrup. Some, some, yeah, I, well, something you know you had cellular and and uh, the two theories serum and, and blood. So that's true. That's, that's a good point, John. Um, yeah. So it's, it's it's something I'm looking into. I it's and it's something I think I really overlooked to be honest with you. And then what? Sub-zero temperatures. Oh, sub-zero temperatures. Um, Archangel had an epidemic in the middle of winter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So in what conditions? What, what was having Archangel be a color of this? Wow. I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, what year was that? Like in the early 20s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in the 20s, the Vibrio lived. It would, you had cases in Russia every month. Throughout the 21 through about 23, it, and this is I think this is part of this evolution of the vibrio. It, it become more, it, it was more, it had more endurance. It was less, you know, less deadly, but it could hang around for a long time. The cell tore and something. Who knows what other vibrios? You know, they is, had. It, is there any sense of what the vector was? I mean, if this is being carried by warm body transport, then the temperature doesn't make any difference. Well, what what what, what I'm, I the, the, I think it's human, you know, uh, or in the, in the water. Um, some of it, some in Ashrakhan, they they were believed to have dumped refuse, you know, try, trying to get rid of this refuse. They just dumped it on their ice in the river. Well, the ice melts and it goes down into the river, and, and, and whatever bacteria is there infects the whole river. Uh, I, I heard uh, people with pretty good knowledge of science tell me that if, if it freezes, it'll actually preserve it. So, you know, rather than kill them. I'm, I'm, I'm really unsure of that, but that's a really good question. They did have winter epidemics, you know, which kind of surprised me. Well, how many epidemics, I mean, if you were to count up the, 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 the year multiplications of epidemics, and how many were associated with various other kinds of trauma, aka pre existing family, pre existing rebellious, uh, rebellion, 1905, disruption of social. So disruptive the system. Um, and how many were just kind of random? Epidemics? Yeah. I think, in my opinion, from what, what I have seen, all of them had some kind of trauma. You had 1891 famine, you had 1892. You had a 1904 uh, uh, famine on the Volga. You, 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 had a, you had an epidemic in 1904. You had the building of the railroad in Siberia. The, 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 this is the X factor. It is, yeah, you're right. And this is what these guys were talking about in 1905, but they... But they were sort of chemical, but in fact, it's actually, it's got to do with social disruption that leads to... Yeah. And they're trying to articulate that. I think they understood that. They just, I, I don't know, you know, that they, you know, they, I think, I think it's, a, it's a difficult thing to... But the X factor, I think, can take on any, or the Y factor, I'm sorry, can take on about any, you know, social or environmental issues or some number of issues, you know, whether it worked exactly what Ben Barber said, you know. Um, but, and actually, I think, I think the uh, Z was actually the poison, the cholera poison itself. So why is, there isn't one right, right, why? Not that I'm aware of, no. No, I think, it, I think it could take on a number of, you could have a number of whys, I think. Oh, well, 
I guess sort of Professor Brooks stole my thunder a bit. And this oh, is something, sorry. And this is, <laughs> well, because we touched on this over lunch, too, about the, the link between nutrition uh, and outbreaks of disease. Like you see it, you know, it's, it's in Europe during sort of this, this dip in nu nutritional status, and then it kind of goes away, and cholera goes away, and then it sort of happens again in Russia. You know, you have the famine in 91, cholera, and then you have famine in 04, and then cholera breaks out again. Um, but you, you mentioned briefly over lunch that, that the regime was focused on fighting hunger. And I was wondering, you know, was there any sort of discourse that bridged these two? Was this a sort of two-front battle, one against disease, one against famine? Did anybody sort of speak to one and the other? You know, do you see any of that, or is this kind of, you know, because sort of as, as you go into the 20th century, you see more and more interest in nutritional science. You know, is this something that, that's going on in Russia, too? Or do you, do you have any sense about that? I mean, this is sort of also on the topic of being beyond the scope of this project, but yes. I don't know if you have any sense of that. I, yeah, that's a great question, Vaughn, and, and you're right. Um, I think it has to do with changing attitudes and to developing the social aspects of social hygiene exactly when it, it should be called social hygiene is, is sort of a question. Um, but uh, I, I think the Soviets, and, uh, especially Nikolai Samosko, who was the commissar and was a close friend of, of Lenin, really understood this idea, as, as did other uh, top Soviet officials. And Lenin was, I think, smart enough to listen. I think, I think he understood it, too. I think he followed this. He was a, an attorney, but he followed this medical discourse. Of course, he had Samosko advising him, and yeah, you're right. Cholera, you don't see as much about cholera in the early 20s. What you start really seeing is, is a lot of articles in, in journals on famine, and I think this is all about social hygiene and raising the, 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 the standard of living and the level, and cholera goes way down when you do that. Does that just displace the discourse on, on cholera and disease in general, or is it... It doesn't displace the, the discourse on disease in general because you start seeing a lot about malaria and, and other diseases. But but this whole idea of the, war, the fight with cholera, the war with cholera, it sort of disappears because cholera is dissipating and it's not as big a problem. They, they feel that they, they can put a grip on it, that they have a handle on it by the end of the 20s. And, and it's a big victory for them to, to, to be because, you know, they have to, to say that we're better than the czars, we, you know, and we're can't have cholera if we're going to compete with Western Europe. If we're going to, if, if socialism is a better lifestyle than capitalism, we can't have cholera. It, it's, it's a slap in the face. So I think they were pretty smart about it, actually. Something I didn't really talk about was, that Nick brought up, was that the measures themselves, it was a reactive type measure. They never put in quarantines along the borders and stop cholera. I th and there seems to be this assumption in that laboratory bacteriology you know, laboratory bacteria actually had a lot to do with the feeding power. I'm not trying to say that it did not. But it was a, it was a very holistic approach, and they never tried to stop it. When I was in uh, Serato in 2008, there were five cases on the railroad, and they quarantined it in Moscow, and that was it. So it's a reactive. It's neo-quarantinism plus nutrition. It's, it's very broad. So it's, it's hard to put in one. But, but I think that this whole idea of social hygiene, everybody was on board with that by the early 20s. That's what I think got rid of cholera, or or stop these large ep epidemics. They didn't really get rid of it. John, I was thinking in terms of the two agents. Uh, speaking of uh, you know all these pandemics, the initial four or five are caused by Vibrio cholerae, which has its seat in uh, the Bay of Bengal, and then you talk about uh, El Tor. Uh, did that uh, uh, change the dynamics in terms of addressing cholera in terms of Preventive measures, uh, for instance, uh, depending on uh, the environment in which uh, the agent is to be found. Or well, that's a really good point. I, I, I don't know that it did. I, I, I think it may have reinforced the idea that we can't keep cholera out because there are these local outbreaks and we can't explain them and, and we can't stop them. Um, I, I was convinced that, I, you know, I don't know when El Tor started. You know, they found it in 1905. I, I'm sure it, it had to be around long before that. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to some of the earlier epidemics, the cholera was just so saturated in Russia that, mm -hmm. that, it, that could, there could have been El Tor there as well then too. But of course, what the evolutionary biologists say is that El Tor becomes more dominant uh, in the later epidemics, uh, which seems to make sense. That the, the death rate goes down in the early 20th century. The sixth pandemic is not as deadly as, as the fifth or, or on back. 
not nearly as dim. But, but in cases, in some cases, you still have 50 and 60 percent. Uh, in one case in Persia, I think in, they had an extremely high, like 80 or 90 percent, but the, the, the epidemic burned out real quick. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm skeptical of that number anyway. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say, but I think there was definitely, but it's a slow process. I think. Again, again, the factors that call end, uh, cause endemicity, when you're talking about aquatic <coughs> reservoirs, I think... Uh, you mentioned the Volga. Uh, which are the regions specifically that are endemic? Well, the, the Volga, Ashrakhan gets, gets and, and Ashrakhan got nailed with all tour throughout the century. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, it's right in that that, that area there in the, in the Caspian. It's, it's, a, it's a delta. It's very similar to, to, to the Ganges in, in the, the Bay of Bengal, mm -hmm. except that it's, you know, a little further north and, 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 and west. Mm -hmm. um, and has a little different climate. But uh, Ashrakhan always got hit. As uh, Professor Campbell said, the, the, uh, the Black Sea has always been a traditional, uh, uh, and, and he definitely, I, I, I believe, you know, that this is a traditional hotbed of, or you know, pool of, of epidemics. Mm -hmm. So they're they're sitting right there on these these waterways, and, and even in Petersburg, which is an artificially built city that's built below, it's built on a swamp basically. Mm -hmm. Really, what not was a, was not. Put in a good place as far as epidemics are concerned. You know, it's kind of like New Orleans. You know, it's it's, it's not good geography. It's, you know. So I guess the best they could do would be quarantine. quarantine well, one, if it gets in, it, 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 it seems to me that no matter where the vibrio got into Russia, these same, it, it flared up in these same places because they were environmentally predisposed to to have. You had different outbreaks in different cities. And when they started applying measures along the Volga, at the end, it sort of it sort of goes back over to the Black Sea, and then they, they sort of shift their focus to the Black Sea, and then it sort of disappears between between the two of the last cases, and it, and it, and it comes back. You know, spread, spread. Oh, sorry, yes, this is far from my field, but I'm, I'm very interested in this, <clears throat> which you know this period you're talking about is one. I mean, also I'm sort of interested more in the metaphorical and the moral sanitarianism parts of parts of this. We have this period of, of course, rising nationalism, but also the kind of universalizing discourse of, of modern medicine, right? This sort of, you have this universal on the one side and the national on the other. And so I was wondering if you could say, and, and also cholera has, even in this discussion, right, cholera is, is the kind of opposite of the climbing wall on the college campus, right? It's, it's the measure by which you've made it or not, right? And if you have cholera, like, you're, you're just definitely out. And so it becomes, it becomes, this, it becomes this, you know, even you say, even the UN couldn't stop it. Is how you sort of frame this first part. And we could ask a lot of questions about what the UN could or couldn't stop, but but it but it becomes this this moral checkbox to like, can you stop cholera? Okay, you're one of us, right? And if we look at the pandemics, the waves of pandemics, what we see is smaller and smaller parts of the globe as this sort of wave of development also goes counter to that. So I was wondering if you could say something about sort of Russian discourses about cholera as particular national discourses. Because in this culture section, you're, the things that you're saying are about the same things you would expect people to say about cholera in other places, right? So that, so that although there may be particular Russian science about this, are there Russian metaphors or Russian ideas or Russian sort of Russian takes on sanitarian views that are particular, that are particular nationalistic, as opposed to this, what I see here is a more of the universal discourse about un, unsanitary conditions and cleanliness, which is surprisingly fits minorities and poor people more than it does other other places. Thanks, Cody. Yes, you, you bring up something that I, that I left out. In Russia, they looked at it as, they, they called it, they always called it Asiatic cholera. And they called it the Asiatic guest. Uh, this is the Asiatic guest, the unwanted Asiatic guest. At the same time, they would write, the, the physicians would write tracts that said, our Asiatic makeup means that, that we cannot organize and stop this disease from coming in. They, they saw in themselves their Asiatic nature. And and, and I actually, I wrote a paper, actually, that it, it would not fit in with this paper at all. It was on 1905. But it's like they couldn't make up their mind if, if they wanted to uplift, you know, the Asians or, or, or kick them out, you know, purge themselves up. You know, they, they had there's this, this tension in, within themselves because they saw themselves as Asiatic and they wanted to be European really bad. They, they, they really, that was, that, was a, that was really important for them to be European. So I, I think that's, that's what you're talking about there. And, and so the, the 
this, the doctors and scientists you're talking about, they, they imagine themselves in this kind of, I mean, their discourse is this European discourse of it as opposed to uh, this recognizing their Asian guests or their Asian, even their Asian selves, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and, and uh, that's why Chinese medicine, even the, the Kirillov, the guy who studied Chinese medicine, said these, these Asians, they, 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 seek the, the comp they seek their own quacks. You know, they go to their quacks, and they, you know they don't they don't trust us. You know, but then at the same time, they, they see themselves as, as we have this Asiatic makeup in our culture that we, we need to purge it, get get rid of it. So it's, it, there's a lot of tension there, and they definitely they they look to Europe, no question about it. Sure. Well, what you done you got several versions of epidemiology here, and I defer to our colleagues in public health, uh, but um, the, the problem is some of it is inference by statistics. I mean, there's a grouping of this here, so we make an inference, and that is not a mechanical operation, and yet we think it's true. Um, the most obvious thing uh, in recent history was tobacco and, and lung cancer, which was based solely, solely on statistics. No one could show any mechanism that suggested such a thing. And uh, so that's one aspect of epidemiology. The second is the persistent theme which comes up in your paper and elsewhere. Poor people get sicker than rich people. And that's another kind of epidemiology. And, and you, we're getting all these things mixed together. Um, it's very tricky. And the epidemiologists are not themselves often very clear on this. And they mix things up too, I think. But I'll defer to someone else on that. Well, I, I agree that they, they do. You know, it, it's very, especially when you start talking about culture and, and social issues, it, it becomes confusing. It, it's very confusing to me. Um, well, yes, uh, I actually have a question. Um, you talk about the discourse, uh, so, so um, getting back to the idea of the intellectual history, you talk about the discourse of these um, professional hygienists, community physicians, and so on, how they talk to each other. Um, I've been curious how they talk to the broader public, uh, and I wonder if this can get at one of Nick's points about uh, the in implementation of practices and, and how they interact with the growing newspapers. You know, we know newspapers are increasingly widespread across Russia right now. Uh, and, uh, and, and so on, to talk about newspapers. So how, how do they present themselves in power to the outside, to the public, not only for officials, but uh, to the public. And how are they trying to convince the public to adopt certain measures? Certain measures? That's, a, that's an excellent point, Brother. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, going back to the, uh, the, the late 19th century, the writing these pamphlets. Uh, cholera, not so bad as people think. Why you should not be afraid of cholera. You know, these sort of pamphlets, which are interesting to see. And then as it goes on, you know, I'm, I'm always struck with what Sheila Fitzpatrick talked about with these uh, campaigns of the railroad where they, and, and Ken has the propaganda state, they start, these circulars go back to, you know, cholera beware, but but I think the Soviets were much more organized and, 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 and much, and, and this is probably where the break is, they really communicated much better with the common person. Of course, we know that the, the common person in, in 1920 could read Far more people could read than in 1890, uh, like the, the book, when the Russian uh, learned to read. We know that's when that happened. I think that was really important. And, and I think these campaigns along the railroads and, and these, uh, you could call it propaganda, but, but education campaigns is what they really were. And, and I think this really helped. Uh, I think Trisha Starks has a, has a really good uh, work on that, actually. I, I need to get back in that. But yeah, I think it's important. Let's give Nick the last word. Good. I just kind of round this off. I'm so glad I could bring this back full circle. I, I have uh, 
So I just I was struck. We were talking about the, the kind of medicine and how we thought about medicine, and uh, it's one of the things that uh, I don't know. One thing I've been thinking about a lot, having spent some time out in, in Siberia, is the degree to which Tibetan medicine was of, of particular importance in the late 19th, early part of the 20th century. So the Tsar had, in fact, a, a, a doctor in the court who came out of the Tibetan tradition uh, because of the kind of respect that the, that the monarchical family had for, uh, for Tibet. And, and so I, this was something that I sort of, I, when you spend time out there, and you suddenly realize that's what everybody kind of focuses on, and we don't here. And I wonder whether, in fact, we may be missing part of the story. I mean, you talk about the European focus, but I also wonder to what degree um, and I haven't seen sort of people other than sort of folks coming out of Buryat and other places writing about this, but to what degree, in fact, you know, other uh, types of medicine are being uh, looked at, uh, and, and that this might help us understand some of the different perspectives of Russian doctors, and particularly that the Tibetan medicine was extraordinarily, I mean, particularly under Nicholas II, it was extraordinarily well dispersed uh, within the kind of medical community, as far as I can tell. That's what well, it's sort of fascinating. And, 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 and because no Western scholar has taken this on, and, and I, you know, and you go to you go to Buryatia, and there's just tons of exhibits about this, and books to read, and all these sorts of things. And I haven't had, I, mean, I haven't really had a chance to really kind of think this through. But I was just sort of struck by by Dodi's comment and your reply that that you know here's this other medical tradition that is um, yeah. that I wonder somebody should write, but uh, some somebody should not, somebody else should write a project. <laughs> on this, but I think it's really sort of a fascinating question. I also want to just go back to the the, um, the water infrastructure, I'll call it by its sort of nice palatable terms. But, uh, I think so. It's all about sanitation. Um, there's, there's a point that we talk about the deplorable sanitary conditions. And, you know, I, I spend most of my days trying to say Russia wasn't quite as bad as everybody thinks it was. Uh, it's just my knee jerk reaction. And, and I wondered whether, you know, this was a quote from one of the, um, I forget which one of it was, but one of the, I think, but in any case, I was sort of wondering to what degree whether, in fact, we have to rethink. I mean, those, that sounds like a terminology for somebody who's trying to push an agenda, right? Yeah. We call it a deplorable. And so, and it seemed to a certain degree, you know, in the paper, and we all have taken the idea of a deplorable sanitary conditions as as true, because, well, it fits with Russia, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. Russia's always kind of that way. Um, but whether, in fact, we should question that a little bit more, that, in fact, that that reflects it reflects agendas and discourse at the time, and I sort of mean, George, this was coming out of your dissertation with the uh, with the way in which in, in, in Yalta there were these very strong efforts to kind of clean up the place, and then their successes ultimately in a lot of ways in doing that, and and, and the larger sort of efforts within zone structure to kind of make, uh, to, to clean up and in order to kind of create this kind of structure. So I don't know, it's just uh, it's been bugging me. Uh, so I thought I'd bring it up just because I got to get it off my chest. I can we make that a final comment? because we actually have people coming in to do the Let us put our hands together. <laughs>